is Tuesday, December 15th, 2015. This is the Fairmont Area School Board meeting. Um, after following this meeting at 6 p.m., we will have our truth and taxation hearing. So if anyone's watching this now and would like to come at 6 p.m., we'll begin that. Our roll call this evening is um, all members of our school board are present. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, uh, now, we, you should have a green <coughs> agenda in front of you, but um, has everyone had a chance to review the minutes from our last meeting? I have, and I'd make a motion to approve those minutes. Thank you, Dan. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Nicole. So I have a motion by Dan, a second by Nicole, to approve the November 24th, 2015 school board meeting minutes as printed. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Then we should, you should have the green agenda. And I have no additions or corrections to that. Does anyone have anything needs to be added or talked Danielle, about? Danielle, were you prepared to report on the operations meeting? I mean, does that make a difference? Danielle, I missed part of the meeting, I know, the other day. Yeah. I, got, I could, to, could present on that. Did either way. I mean, I have the minutes, minutes? but I know oh, okay. it's. That's fine, then you can do it. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't see the minutes come. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay, so Danielle's going to stay on that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about that? Okay, I'd entertain a motion. I make I, a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you, Julie. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Nicole. A motion by Julie, second by Nicole, to approve the December 15, 2015 school board meeting agenda as printed on the green form. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, tonight we have, um, I guess it's a school and community report, and we have Chris Engelby here with us today, and she has two things to talk about, We Day at the high school and also the high school blood drive. So welcome and thanks for coming. Good evening. I uh, just want to thank you for letting me uh, come and speak about two of the things that I'm uh, part of right now. Uh, first of all, I have to apologize. I have about 45 students in my We Day group, which we call the cardiac group, um, and um, not one could make it tonight to be with me. So last mm -hmm. year we were able to get about 15 kids, but uh, I tell you, these kids are just always so busy with working and, and uh, athletics and other events going on. So uh, just to give you a little report about uh, the We Day group, I have about 45 students in our cardiac group. We meet about twice a month uh, at 7.50. Uh, and I had 37 students that went to the We Day Conference at the Excel Center in St. Paul in November. Uh, we load the bus at 5 and we leave at 5.15 and it's amazing. I usually have every single person that can make it. They bring their sleeping bags, their pillows, their coffee or whatever and donuts and they're raring to go. But a lot of times they can't make it to a 750 meeting before school so I just always think it's kind of ironic how they can make it for this conference because it is a phenomenal conference 18,000 students from Minnesota high schools that attend it is packed and those tickets are like gold to try to come to the conference and you have to earn the ticket to come to that we day conference and so uh, and we end up raising funds the whole idea of we day is to help our communities and to help uh, you know others in the world as well so that's kind of like the theme is just helping others in the community and the world so um, we get so pumped up at that conference you know because we get kind of excited and so uh, my uh, leaders that are with me are Rebecca Denaway and Teresa Keel and we kind of sat down after that conference and just kind of set up when we're going to meet and all the different things that we want to do so the first thing that we wanted to do was to volunteer to ring the bell for the Salvation Army so we set up one evening uh, on a Thursday at Shopco and I had uh, uh, eight kids that volunteered and did that and they said they all had a great time and then we also set up last Thursday at Fairway and so um, 
I had eight kids that also volunteered um, to ring the bell, and they all, I always kind of, you know, text them back and say, hey, you know, how did it go? Hey, it went great. And so, um, and so I want to just make a comment. I had Abby Fitzgerald and Dana Madsen, two seniors that um, went from four to five at Fairway, and they dressed up. They told me they were going to have an outfit for them. And so they dressed up, and they sent me a picture. And so uh, Dana was a penguin, and Abby was a Christmas box that was, you know, like it was uh, decorated. So they, this was their quote. Abby sent me this back and said, we sang and danced. Pretty sure we just got a record amount of money for that time period. <laughs> and so uh, anybody that went to Fairway during that, that hour, you know, definitely, and they showed me, you know, all the different dances they were doing. And, and uh, you know, how fun, you know, to have my kids to uh, uh, volunteer and, and raise money for Salvation Army. Now, in February, we're going to try to get at least one or two teams to go and do the uh, um, uh, um, the uh, Kids Against Hunger, and that's at the Armory. And so we did that last year, and we just had, you know, a blast. We made tons of meals. We were kind of on a competition, so we were going as fast as we can. And I tell you, I was pretty exhausted afterwards for working. I think it was like a two-hour shift. So we'll do that again in uh, February. And then uh, we're also going to try to do some fundraisings around uh, uh, town to go toward our uh, fundraiser. We are doing um, education in Ecuador. So that's that's where we're going to raise our money for this year, and so uh, and then we're going to uh, also maybe try to do some other local community things uh, for our group. So um, anyway, so that's a we day um, wrap up. Any questions about that? What's group? we? What does is it an acronym or what is the? It, it it's just kind of talking about like we you know helping others and so that's I've never seen like does W stand for something does Z E stand for I've never seen it that way it's always like you know we day and so and it has been live those conferences it's out of uh, Canada and so there's not a lot of conferences in the United States so there's one like in Minneapolis I think there's one in maybe uh, Los Angeles maybe one in Chicago so there's not a lot of them and so um, um, and they always have those live on the internet that you can always watch those conferences go on. And I know Good Morning America actually did, uh, you know, a little uh, blurb about We Day. Um, I think it was in August or September that they were showing a little clip of what We Day, you know, is all about. So, and it's it's kind of cool to see all the different schools of what they do to try to raise funds for you know the We Day program. So. Chicago and Los Angeles and Minneapolis I'll do it on the same day no they're all spread out so okay. like ours was early and then there's usually one I think I saw because there's like little dates on t-shirts that they were having so I think there's one that's going to be in April you know so they kind of really spread them out because they have a lot of them in Canada too and usually they have you know almost the same speakers there's a guy that um, comes and speaks and he has no legs and he moves with his arms and he's you know traveled he's climbed mountains and he always comes to all of their conferences and is a, a speaker that just talks about how to help you know other people and just talk about like you know what he's done you know with his life with the uh, um, you know things that he were you know he was born with so so it's to like raise awareness of the need in the world. Yep, and your community. Need and of the whole thought is helping others, you know, helping others in your community and helping others in the world. So they pick like these pillars for the world fundraisers, and you can pick different countries. They have a program that you can pick, and so like one program is education, um, help like um, bring you know materials to schools, help maybe build a school. Um, another one is water, to try to bring clean water to these uh, countries. Uh, another one is um, to buy goats and to bring goats to families to try to help, you know, produce, you know, the milk and then they can sell that. Uh, and so, yeah, so those are, you know, different things of, of, and then the groups just pick of what they want to do. And our group has always picked the education, but other groups pick water or, you know, um, 
you know, the, the GOAT Foundation. So, yeah, there's a, but they really have a neat program of, of, they just give you this program and then you just set it up and they're always willing. I have a rep that is out of Toronto that I communicate on a regular basis, that she always sends me new bulletins about what's going on. Hey, there's a fundraiser. Would you be interested in this to raise funds for your, you know, uh, for Ecuador? So, yeah, it's really kind of a, a neat program. So the kids never really travel to Ecuador. They just get, they raise the funds and then they're sent through the WE organization. Right. Okay. But there are possibilities at the conference. They always uh, do a raffle and they will pick like maybe one school that gets a free trip and they'll have maybe like two or three people that have a free trip to go to maybe Ecuador or, you know, other places. I know our leaders were kind of looking at possibly you know, maybe trying a, a trip uh, in the future. We ended up getting 15 uh, younger kids that were 8th, ninth, and 10th graders because I'm going to lose quite a few of my seniors uh, after this year. And so we're looking at maybe in the future trying to raise funds and maybe try to go on a trip because what a neat thing to, like, raise funds and be able to go to that country where you're raising funds and mm -hmm. see where your money actually is going to. Mm -hmm. um, so they do have those trips, and, you know, they have different programs of what you can do to try to you know raise funds to go there so I think in the future we would like to do that sometime so how do re you recruit um, students to be in the well, we organization what do you call it we call it's our we day group called the cardiacs and so um, and so and our theme is like to you know help others and so really how we ended up getting those 15 new members is word of mouth I just kind of had a meeting. I said, you know, if you guys have some friends that you want to, you know, try to recruit, and that's how they came. They kept coming, and, and uh, you know, I, I would say, hey, you know, come, and we're going to go to this meeting. And so all of those new members went to that Weed Day conference, and it was awesome. Okay. And so how did you get cardiac? Um, <laughs> the kids picked that, I would guess. Yeah, huh? I, I don't have my notes. I wish I did, but um, uh, Rebecca Denaway kind of came up with that in which it's kind of short for cardinals, and it just kind of um, caring for others, and it's actually for We Day, it's, it's called... Um, uh, you know, caring for others, and, and so we just thought of uh, caring for others and, and just um, having the activities, and so that's how we kind of shorten it up for cardiacs, and so. Okay, so then, like, when you do community day or community service day, is that also part of this we right, in your that, cardiac group? So I have to fill out... Um, two reports in order to go to the next We Day conference. So my first report was due, I think it was uh, um, the middle of November. And so my rep will remind me, hey, don't forget to fill this out. And then they ask different questions like, what world fundraiser are you doing? And then they also have to see that you're doing a local community. So I kind of put in like, okay, Salvation Army we did. Sometimes we might try to go to Heaven's Table. But then the big one is the Community Service Project Day. I write that in too, and that will count Toward helping others in the community. So then are these kids in cardiac, are they part of the leaders of the um, service day? No, thing? That's, that's just, just through it's just part of uh, the Cardinal Connection okay. groups. Okay. All right. Very cool. All right. Anybody else have questions for Chris on that one? One of the things that we want to try to do, and I know it's been hard, is they are willing to bring a speaker down to talk to our whole school about what We Day is, because I know it's been hard to kind of advertise what is We Day. The kids are like, well, what is this We Day? You know, what's the cardiac group? What are these meetings? And so I usually explain it, but if we could have a speaker come down to our high school, um, and then they kind of meet with our small group later on for an hour to kind of get them like more organized, that would be just a huge thing. But unfortunately, they only can usually come in the fall and it's right around homecoming and we cannot I mean we already like take away from class time and so that's been really a hard time and I always say you know if we can have somebody come down in the spring so I'm gonna still try to work on that mm -hmm. if we can get somebody because I think that would make a huge difference of what this program really is all about and so when the kids come back do they like how do do they report on this to the other kids or do you have some kind of 
No, uh, and I wish we would because that's that's why I kind of wanted my kids to come tonight yeah. <clears throat> so they could really tell you, you know, what was your, you know, um, experience of going to that We Day conference because mm -hmm. I think a lot of them were just kind of blown away because it's like almost like a rock concert and then you have these big time speakers that come. Mm -hmm. You know, like Henry Winkler was one of those speakers that came and they only speak for about five, ten minutes. And I was in awe. I kept telling the kids beforehand, hey, we're going to see the Fonz. Guess what they all said? Who's Who? that? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, come on, you guys, happy days. And like, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's right. You guys are just young pups. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so he spoke, and he just, you know, they just always have such a great message of just, you know, helping others. And they talk about people that have dealt with, you know, issues of bullying and and how we can deal with, you know, bullying. And and they have like an anti-bullying campaign that we can do in in April. And um, uh, and so, you know, that's what's kind of neat. So here I was in awe, you know, when Henry Winkler came up and they were all like probably on their phones or talking and like, oh, we don't know who this guy is, but, you know, but yet still, you know, he just had, you know, an awesome message, but uh, we've had Martin Sheen come, Magic Johnson last year. They always have big name uh, band Perry came last year. This year, I hate to say, but I really didn't know the musical groups because they were like more into the teen groups. And so I would always lean down and ask one of my kids, who is that? Don't you know? I'm like, no, sorry. And oh, so I was going to ask you who, like, who does music, but. Oh, know. yeah, it's like big time, you oh. know, bands, individual groups. But I could not tell you one person that was there because I just was not familiar with those, uh, you know. And so, um, but they all knew and they were all dancing and, and hooting and hollering. And so they were like, oh, this is great. You know, this person's coming. And yeah, mm -hmm. so. But it is. It's a big uh, uh, to do with this conference. It's really awesome. And eighteen thousand people. That's a lot of kids. And yeah, it right. really is. And we always have shirts. And where was it? It was at the Excel Center okay. at St. Paul. And we always design shirts. Uh, I know I had the Junkmeyer twins, uh, Jordan and Kelsey and Brianna Jackson, that designed the shirt this year, and it was kind of neon pink. And so everybody asked, "Hey, who's the pink group?" Hey, we're from Fairmont High School, you know. So that was kind of neat to uh, uh, display those shirts and and uh, you know kind of and you know we had 37 kids, so that's a, a big group that you mm -hmm. know came. So is that like average for schools or? How, yeah, anywhere can you, you can. How, well, how do you get the tickets? Yeah, like so you they'll they ask you, like, how many tickets do you need? And so I'll say, okay, I have, like, um, you know, 37 kids in my group. But then, like, we recruited, so we had 15 more kids. And so what ended up happening is um, they'll say, okay, we have some extra ones. How many more do you need? And then they, you know, send us. And they usually have been able to give us, you know, as many as we could. The first year we went, this is our third year there. Our first year they gave us 55 tickets. I had 55 kids up there. And so, but not everybody continued to, you know, go to the meetings and stuff. And so, and I have a requirement now that you need to go to the meetings. You need to, like, be part of our group. And so, like, last year we were in charge of the food service at the uh, fun, family fun fair. And we raised a lot of money. And, you know, it was great, you know. And so, um, but the kids know now in order to go to the conference, you need to be active in our group. And I think that helps. And so it's mostly coming up with projects. Is that what you're doing? Yep. Is when yep. You're That's mostly okay. what we try to do. Okay. And so, and then quickly, um, blood drive. We had um, about a hundred and. I think it was about 103 kids that signed up and adults. Uh, Joe Brown was one of them that donated, which was wonderful. Uh, and so, and then um, we had 83 units of blood that uh, was donated. And so uh, the first hour was like, um, okay, I had a lot of people that couldn't donate because maybe they're hemoglobin or they're, uh, you know, they're low on iron. And so, but I, um, and I had some foreign exchange students that weren't able to uh, give, but then after a while, we really started to pick up, and and uh, it was a it was a good day, and so we were very pleased, and I know the Red Cross was very pleased of how many we were able to uh, donate, and then we'll have another one uh, coming up. I think it's in March, and so usually that one's a little bit less, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to, uh, you know, get that same goal. And so, um, and I have two student um, uh, coordinators that pretty much are in charge of that. I have uh, Eli Green and Ellie Tonder that uh, uh, really help out and, you know, get the donations, pick up everything, and um, it was, uh, uh, it's been wonderful to have them, you know, kind of help me out, and, and we kind of work well as a team, so. Do you have to make 
like an appointment or a schedule? Yep, we you? have the, the, Eli and Ellie go to the English classes about two weeks ahead. They present like a little uh, um, speech about, you know, the importance of donating blood. And then we have a sign-up sheet in the English classes. And that's how they usually sign up. And then I have announcements. I announce it in my um, upper grade health class. And then um, we also have it like on the uh, um, TV screen. Um, and so... Yeah, so that's how we kind of, and then I, a lot of times I have kids that say, hey, now, you know, and they announce it at Cardinal Connections too. So that kind of helps, but it takes a while to get all those kids, but we finally get them. And then Rebecca Denaway does an excellent job. She's the one that kind of gets all their schedules and set up when they're going to donate. And so I, I don't know what I would do with any, you know, with all of those three because they really help me out a lot to do this. What's the age? Um, they can limit. donate 16 or older. Okay. Um, you have to have a parent consent form uh, if you're 16. But after that, um, you can come and donate after you're 17 or, or 18. You just need to have an ID and come in and, and, um, and do that. Well, 103 signing up is pretty good then out of... It was. At first, we only had 81, but the last week, we really, you know, increased. And so, um, and I try to advertise, uh, you know, with the staff, too. We usually have a good number of staff that will donate, and they're regular donators, so... Mm -hmm. So this is a student blood drive. Is it open to the public? If members of the public want to donate, can they? Well, um, usually we don't have enough time to get the community, but I did have a, a gentleman. I didn't get his name, but he came from the community and, and donated, which was wonderful. You know, if, the, if we can fit him in, that's great. Um, but usually it's more like just designated for the school just so we can because we can only go up to two o'clock and we were there until the last people got done donating about uh two thirty which is great because usually it kind of slows down in the afternoon but um but yeah it's 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 just a wonderful cause they're just in so much need of blood and i think it's great for these kids to remember that you know you're saving a person's life by doing this and so and we didn't have really anybody get sick not really faint on us it was wonderful once in a while we'll have those <laughs> so mm -hmm. so where do you hold it at uh in the south gym oh that gym. works out okay. great and then we just kind of um have and the red cross workers they you know they really enjoy that area too and so um and it's it's packed in there but we have it set up really nice and so, and they get treats, the, the kids. So I think some of them maybe want to donate just because, hey, do we get food too? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we feed them well. Mm -hmm. And so because of well, all the donations, to, yeah. you know, yeah. so we have like, um, you know, all the different eating areas. Uh, Culligan, you know, brings us water and Fairway, Hy-Vee, the grocery stores, Walmart, they give us like water um, and baked goods, Perkins, McDonald's brings uh, like their jug of their orange juice, uh, the high see orange drink um, so yeah there's many places that donate and it's just wonderful oh, that's great yeah yeah very cool what else you have to report on that's it that's the that's only two things enough. so far so, till spring right yeah then i'll be back yep so yep, with the big all right thank you guys. all right thanks for coming thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you all right we'll move on to the superintendent's report and calendar superintendent brown well, thank you diane first of all let's take a look at the calendar the end of the year here. Christmas break is coming up. Um, just a reminder that uh, students will be in session until uh, Tuesday, the 22nd of uh, December, and then they'll be gone until January 4th is when they'll come back next year. And we'll go back in the regular schedule. We'll have two uh, school board meetings in January, one on January 12th and one on January 26th. Take a look at the enrollment report. Um, I have a question. On yes. January 6th, um, board members, there, do you see there's a 3-6 staff meeting? Yes, we'll I do. We'll have to let us know if you can attend that okay. before. So think about that. Okay, and thanks. just and speaking of 3-6, so one of the new things that will start on January 4th is on January 4th, the students in grades 3 through 6 will be receiving hot lunch every day. I'm sorry, hot breakfast, breakfast every day. Yeah. That's a new implementation right now. We've just been doing it once or twice a week, but um, starting three, on six. January 4th, grades three, three through six. Okay. Grades uh, K through two will get hot breakfast twice a week. 
but students in grades three through six will get hot breakfast uh, every day starting on January 4th. And then the food service will see how that goes over the month of January. If that works well, then they may consider expanding that every day to the K-1-2. So it's a, it's a trial run? Is that it what is. you're saying? Okay. Well, will they still have the uh, cold option? The No. Okay. No. Students are asking for hot breakfast, and so they're going to get what they ask for. And uh, the uh, food service, they're actually in the, uh, they're, they're currently in, uh, uh, scheduling or ordering additional equipment, hot carts, things like that, that they need additional trays uh, to provide the hot breakfast. I see another thing on the calendar. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Board High School student lunch. Uh, so you have to me. decide about that on January 7th at 11:30. So we should let Judy know if you're if we if you can attend that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. And we did have a. There was a meeting last week, a luncheon last week, of the 56 new students that we have at the high school this year. These are students that uh, came to us um, from other districts or foreign exchange students, uh, St. John Vianney and St. Paul's Lutheran, and they had a luncheon for the 56 students. And uh, that was really interesting to talk to the students, and uh, especially the, we have a foreign exchange student from China, and um, we have another foreign exchange student from... I think of where the hell the students from? Norway. I think it is Norway. The one that's playing uh, hockey for the first time. Spain. Who's that? <coughs> okay, he was not there that day. Okay. And and so. another student from Spain. We heard. Really? No, I'm oh. just repeating yes. her because you can't hear her on the microphone. That is correct. <laughs> Mr. Brown apologizes. I have a bit of a head cold right now, and so. Okay, uh, back to student enrollment. Uh, right now, uh, latest student enrollment, 1,695 students. Compared to last year at this time, we were serving 1,693. And uh, January tends to be a busy month for high schools. Uh, that tends to be sometimes when we actually pick up more students and open enroll for the second semester. And so we think probably between now and the next three weeks will probably be some changes. And that... Uh, I just want to brief the board, too. I have a few minutes tonight to talk about uh, the federal government last week passed uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act, and uh, President Obama signed that act into law last week. And uh, this was a law that replaces the No Child Left Behind law that was passed in 2002 and signed by President George W. Bush. And um, the federal government <clears throat> you know, has been involved in uh, public education since 1965 is when uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was passed by President Johnson. But uh, the nice thing about this new act is that it is giving uh, states more flexibility and more power over what tests to decide on how to test. And uh, it gives states more authority to decide what curriculum to uh, have their students uh, learn. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion statewide or nationwide about the Common Core curriculum. And uh, just a reminder that in Minnesota, Minnesota has uh, adopted the Common Core for language arts, but we did not adopt the Common Core for mathematics. And the reason for that is the state feels that our mathematics standards are so much higher than the national Common Core math standards that we decided not to lower our standards and go with the nationwide. So our standards are, are a lot higher. We expect more out of our students in math than the rest of the country. Uh, but uh, our students will still be uh, given tests throughout the year, but again, we'll have more flexibility. Uh, the federal government is going to fund um, the new Every Student Succeeds Act uh, at the tune of uh, $24.9 billion, almost $25 billion. And that's very similar. Under the No Child Left Behind, they funded that at $23 billion a year. So it's a little bit of an increase in federal funding. Uh, a big thank you, though, for uh, one of our U.S. congressmen from Minnesota, uh, Representative John Klein, is a Republican congressman from the metropolitan area uh, just south of the Twin Cities. And uh, Representative John Klein is the chair this year of the House uh, Education Committee, and he was one of the key people that moved that piece of legislation through. Another interesting point about John Klein, uh, when President Reagan was president, John Klein was in the military, and he was the person that would carry the nuclear bomb codes, what they call the presidential football. It's a special case that has the nuclear codes in case the president has to declare nuclear war. But Representative John Klein, when he was in the military, he carried the, the nuclear codes 
around for President uh, Reagan. Uh, John Klein is retiring from the United States Congress at the end of next year. He has chosen not to run. But this new law passed on a very bipartisan method. Uh, 359 members of the House passed it, voted for it. Only 64 <laughs> voted against it. And in, in the United States Senate, 85 uh, senators voted for it. 12 voted against it. And the other people that didn't vote are out running for president. OK, that's true. Anyway, so we'll watch for that. And then finally, the, um, a group of legislators uh, met with uh, a group of superintendents on Friday. We met in uh, North Mankato at the South Central Service Cooperative, and I do have a handout that I put together for you, but uh, superintendents from Fairmont, Waseca, New Ulm, Blue Earth area, St. James, Martin County West, and Maple Island. We met with three state representatives, Clark Johnson. Clark Johnson represents North Mankato and parts of St. Peter. Of course, Bob Gunther represents uh, Martin County and other counties in the area. And Tony Cornish would be the other half of Senator Julie uh, Rose in the Senate District. And uh, only Clark Johnson serves on the Education Committee, but uh, we had a very nice meeting that lasted for two hours. And uh, we talked about a whole series of topics. The first thing we wanted to do was to basically thank the legislators for their support for public education. Uh, we've really had a good run the last few years, and, and it's been a bipartisan effort in Minnesota. Democrats and Republicans have worked together to increase uh, the state aid for schools. We also really thank them for the uh, idea that uh, school districts can now levy for the long-term facility maintenance, and that will allow all schools, especially the smaller schools like us out here in outstate Minnesota, to be able to uh, levy for the maintenance of our buildings in the future. And of course, those of, you, those of you on operations committee, you know that Dave Turnberg has put together a 10-year plan that we've already approved, and we really do appreciate that. Uh, they talked a little bit about the 2016 legislative bonding bill. Uh, the legislature is expected to pass a $1 billion bonding bill, and uh, that uh, would be for you know big building projects that will take place. And uh, we talked a little bit about the gas tax. Uh, there was not a lot of support for increasing the gas tax. Uh, we talked a lot about the pending teacher shortage, and that was something that I think caught some of these uh, state representatives off guard a little bit. They didn't realize that uh, all the schools, every one of these schools that are represented had a challenging time finding certified teachers to teach. And uh, that was kind of a surprise to them. So we talked a little bit about how we could encourage more people to consider going into teaching. Uh, we talked about uh, the concentrated formula of compensatory revenue. Schools get additional money based on the number of free and reduced lunch students that you have, but in the metropolitan area, because they have a higher percentage of free and reduced lunch students, they get a higher number uh, of reimbursement. And uh, we talked about maybe someday that'd be nice if we treated every school district the same. You know, a poor child here should be treated the same as a poor child in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So the formula is different? Or yeah, it's called a concentrated formula. So the higher the percentage, as the percentage <coughs> of a free and reduced lunch numbers go up, you get more, it generates more money per student. And of course, we're at just a little over 50% at the elementary, but some of these schools in Minneapolis and St. Paul are 80 and 90% free and reduced lunch, and so they get a couple thousand dollars more per student than we do. And um, those of us in greater Minnesota always argue that you know, a student in need is a student in need, and it shouldn't matter whether you live in Minneapolis or St. Paul. That uh, what should matter is that if you qualify for free and reduced lunch, you should probably get the same compensatory revenue. But that's a political issue that's always fought between outstate Minnesota and, and the inner cities. We talked about the Board of Teaching. Uh, the Board of Teaching and the Minnesota Department of Ed both have jurisdiction over teacher licensure. and. Uh, the Board of Teaching are the p folks that are responsible to generate the tests that t new teachers have to take. And uh, they were under a mandate by the legislature to come up with a new test, and uh, they have failed to do that. And so we talked a little bit about maybe it's time to eliminate the Board of Teaching and just have the Minnesota Department of Ed do it like they used to. But that becomes a political issue, too. The uh, Education of Minnesota has a number of uh, members on the Board of Teaching. Uh, we talked about stackable credentials. That's a new phrase that I haven't heard much about, but uh, they talk about stackable credentials of, of allowing someone that maybe is a certified electrician uh, that may be able to teach people how to do wiring, but uh, doesn't have a education degree that maybe we could do a stackable uh, credential where they could let them teach while they're going back to school to get their uh, teaching license. 
And uh, we talked about that in a lot of areas of computer science, math, science, business education, and vocational, those places that we find it's hard to recruit faculty members. We talked about uh, the possibility of new teacher loan forgiveness to encourage new teachers. We talked about if there was an idea of maybe state funding for school resource officers. Uh, we talked about economic development zones, about how important it is for the state, obviously, and especially out here in greater Minnesota, to have economic development zones, which would encourage uh, better paying jobs, more industry maybe to come out here to greater Minnesota that would generate additional revenue. One thing we talked about, we spent a lot of time talking about the need for mental health services for some of our students. Um, every single school district has students that uh, are in need of mental health. Uh, services and we talked about the fact that the state should look at that we talked about the need for full funding for special education we talked about uh, community service schools uh, one example that we talked about was Brooklyn Center up in the cities where they actually have a doctor and a nurse and a dentist that are actually inside the school and they provide services to the students right there so instead of a, stu if a student sick they come to school and they have an infirmary right there. They get their dental care there. It's kind of a full service idea for a community service school. Um, and then we talked about the future growth of early childhood education. You know, the governor is promoting the idea of universal uh, preschool for all four-year-olds, and many schools are concerned about the lack of facilities for, for universal four-year-old preschool. And then we also talked about funding for school security. You know, Senator Rosen last year had an amendment on a bill that I went up and testified in favor of that would allow school districts to levy uh, local property taxes to secure the buildings. And so if we ever have to do something at the high school to secure the entrance, our high school right now is, is pretty open. Once you come in those main doors, you can go anywhere without checking in. And um, that amendment didn't pass, unfortunately, but uh, it's something I think we want to continue to push for. So very good. And we also thank these legislators for their service. Uh, you know, legislators have to deal with a gazillion issues. And of course, as educators, we deal with education and transportation and making sure our kids are safe. But uh, legislators are dealing with, uh, you know, a hundred other important issues, and we really did appreciate the time that they came and spent the two hours with us on Friday afternoon. And uh, they're very, you know, very caring people, so we did appreciate that. Any questions? Any questions for Superintendent Brown? Well, mental health is a issue for families, not just the kids, too. So that's probably something they have to take a look at too. <coughs> Excuse Any me. other questions for Superintendent Brown? Okay, then we'll move on to financial business. We have some donations, Dan. Uh, yes, we have a couple. Uh, there is a revised Appendix A, and then there is also, if I can find it here, another Appendix B. Uh, first, I will uh, introduce the following resolution and move its adoption. Whereas the Fairmont Booster Club donated items totaling $24,429 eight cents to Fairmont area schools sports programs during 2015 be it resolved by the Fairmont area school board to gratefully accept this gift thank you Dan's our second second thank you Nicole so I have Dan introducing the resolution and Nicole with the second of that I see on the back side of that sheet is all um, shows the different purchases uh, that were made including um, boy golf balls tennis balls softball pitching machines baseball bats uh, weight room, computer software programs, new garbage uh, cans for the gym, and then um, the Hall of Fame banquet, uh, which was uh, uh, a very nice uh, event here earlier this fall, too. So. And they also donate a lot of awards, don't they, mm -hmm. to the different, every yep. um, sport, yes. The, the plaques and, and their, their uh, programs and such that they have, that the various sports have at the end of their seasons, mm -hmm. too. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole list there. So, all right. So I have Dan introducing the resolution and Nicole with the second. <coughs> we have to vote. Danielle? Aye. Dan? Aye. Chair votes aye. Nicole? Aye. Julie? Aye. Rufus? Aye. The resolution is adopted, and we thank the Booster Club for those donations and all the hard work that they do to um, get all that money and then to um, give it out, too. So thank you. And then next one. And there's another in Appendix B. <laughs> I would introduce the following resolution and move for its adoption. Whereas Grace Lutheran Church Missions donated $1,000 to the Martin County Literacy Council. 
be it resolved by Fairmont Area School Board to gratefully accept the gift. Thank you, Dan. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Julie. So I have Dan introducing the resolution and Julie with the second. We also have to vote on that one. Danielle? Aye. Dan? Aye. Chair votes aye. Nicole? Aye. Julie? Aye. Rufus? Aye. The resolution is adopted and we thank Grace Lutheran Missions for their donation to the Literacy Council. All right. Thank you, Dan. Then we'll move on to financial bills and reports and Sue is here this evening to talk about that. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight on the agenda, we have the approval of the November 2015 Treasurer's Report, wire transfers from November 20th to December 10th, and the payment of the December 8th bills. Um, so I'll begin with the sheet that looks like this. You can see that. On the top is an um, expenditure report as of the end of November. Um, this is something that you haven't seen for a few months. Um, now that the board approved uh, a revised budget here on November 24th, um, I thought I would bring this back. So on the left, you have the different funds, and then you have the column that actually has the um, board approved budget amount. The next column shows our monthly expenditures. So that's our expenditures for November. And then the next column is year to date, so from July 1 through the end of November. And then we have the percent of budget spent by each fund. So like in the general fund, we, are, um, we have spent about 28% of our budget. So then I kind of look at that big picture and think, okay, does that make sense? Well, you know, our teacher pay starts in September, um, so September, October, November, so we're at 25% of their pay. So, you know, looking at that, that makes sense to me. So then I'll just kind of take a peek at that. Um, any questions on that? Okay, then the um, next part is our transfers from November 20th to December 10th, just a few to... Um, point out um, the second one is our net payroll from November 494,000 uh, second one from the bottom then is our P card payment six thousand eight hundred and seventy seven dollars and I'll go through that register with you here in a moment and then at the bottom we have our total payroll but disbursements for November was nine hundred and sixty nine thousand okay and then on the back of that you have the um, treasurer's report or cash balance report as of the end of November. So we have all the different funds and the different accounts within each fund and then with that cash balance is at the end of the month. If there are no questions, then I'll move to the um, PCARD um, report or the um, register. Uh, just one to bring to your attention there. It's the payment made out to Minnesota Secretary of State. What we do each year with um, renting out the the hunt farm is we put a lien on the crop and just to make sure that we're paid for the rent. This is something that the operations committee had asked us to do a few years ago. So then we file this online with the Sec Minnesota Secretary of State. And this is actually for the 2016 growing season. Do you have any questions on anything else listed on the P card register? Okay, then I can go to the register dated uh, December 8th. And here in December, we just um, have, are having one meeting, but we do follow our schedule for paying our bills. Um, so we have um, these payments dated um, November, or December 8th, and then Julie, our treasurer, came in and met with me the day before, and we reviewed those before they were sent out. So I just have a few to bring to your attention. Um, the payment to Minnesota Theater International is for rentals for the uh, Mary Poppins, the musical from last month. And then check number 57880 made out to MRCI. This is for a couple of our um, special needs students, and this is for their voc rehab. Um, tip In the past, this was paid by Southern Plains, and then they billed us, but we've streamlined that a bit, so it, um, we're paying it direct. And then check number 57890 made out to Scholastic Book Fairs. That was for the book fair held at the elementary here this fall. Do you have any questions on that register? As I mentioned, Julie and I reviewed that one on December 7th, and the rest of the reports we did review this, um, this, after this afternoon before the board meeting. There are no questions. I then would make a motion to approve the November 2015 Treasurer's Report, wire transfers for November 20th, 2015 to December 12th, 10th, 2015, and payment of the December 8th, 2015 bills. Thank you, Julie. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rufus. I have a motion by Julie, second by Rufus, to approve the Treasurer's Report for December as presented. Any further questions? 
If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. So then um, your next check run will be the December 22nd? Correct. And then Julie will go you'll yep. visit we with that. We have a time set. She's going to come in beforehand. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. So then we're just. Yeah, that way vendors can continue to be paid on time and just keep that cycle. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next on the agenda is our truth and taxation hearing, but we need to wait a few minutes to handle that. So that will go to the end of the agenda. And then if you look ahead, there's um, no old business listed on there. And then we will go to new business, the MSBA conference, Julie. Yes, um, the MSBA Winter Conference, the Leadership Conference, will be held January 15th and 16th up in the cities. And by law, the school board um, must approve the board members attending this overnight conference because we stay overnight. And um, members this year that have, um, are planning to go include Diane Gerhardt, Rupus Rodriguez, Don, Dan Brookins, and myself. So I would make a motion to approve um, board members' overnight attendance at the MSBA Leadership Conference January 15th and 16th, 2016. Thank you, Julie. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dan. A motion by Julie, second by Dan to approve the um, MSBA Leadership Conference attendance by school board members. Any further discussion or questions on that item? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Thank you. And we have a couple of employments. Um, mm -hmm. Nicole? Uh, the first is regarding the employment of a dean at the elementary school. Four candidates were interviewed in the committee. The interview committee consisted of Jim Davison, Michelle Rosen, Carly Sonic, Amy Becker, and Derek Spear. They unanimously recommended that Sean Chambers be hired for the position. He holds a bachelor's degree in health administration from Ashford University with past experience, including serving as a youth counselor and behavioral health and intervention specialist at Forage Ridge Youth Services, working as a professional paraprofessional for Southern Plains Co-op, and serving as the mentoring coordinator for Martin County. Most recently, uh, Sean's position with Martin County was that of family preservation worker. With that, I move to approve the employment of Sean Chambers as the Elementary Dean of Students, effective January 4, 2016, through the end of the 2015-16 school year at a salary of BA Step 1. Thank you, Nicole. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Julie. So I have a motion by Nicole, second by Julie, to approve the employment of Sean Chambers as a Dean of Students at Fairmont Elementary. Any further discussion on that item? Um, well, I think it'll probably come up in the staff welfare, but we did talk about it um, as we'll have to decide if we're going to continue that position then for the next year. So this will just be to the end of the school year for Mr. Chambers. So, yeah. Do you have anything to add on that? Okay. <laughs> All right. So I have a motion by Nicole, second by Julie. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Second one? Yes, it's uh, for a title aid. The current Title Aid is not able to continue her noon hour supervision, supervision responsibilities because she will be student teaching during that time. Uh, we advertise for a two-hour supervisory aid, and Principal Davison is recommending that Amber Nakmus be hired for the position. That I move to approve the hiring of Amber Nak Nakmus uh, for, as a supervisory noon hour aid beginning December 16, 2015 at a salary of step one. Thank you, Nicole. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rufus. Motion by Nicole, second by Rufus, to approve the employment of Amber Nakmus as the supervisory noon hour eight. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, then we're down to board committee reports, the operations committee meeting, Danielle. Um, yeah, the operations committee met on Thursday, December 10th. Um, we had three things on the agenda. We Sue briefed us on the truth and taxation hearing that she's going to talk about shortly here. Um, and then the fine arts budget, the high school band, choir, and orchestra um, have requested a $6,000 increase in their travel budget for the cu current school year. Um, and the oper operations committee approved that request with the understanding that principalness will meet with the fine arts department to go over the number of students that will be missing school for the events. Um, and then the replacement of a sound system mixer at the high school. 
Uh, the public address system was installed in 1992. Um, the cost to replace it is $1,349. So the committee approved <coughs> to purchase a new one and install that. That was at the PAC? Or where no, was it? No, in the gymnasium at the, the high school. Oh, the gym? oh, yeah, I was at a game the other night and it didn't work at all. Uh -oh. Just what? That's, that's why it's being replaced oh, and the mixer it, it does we did do the research it, it was installed in 1992 and they're not replacing the entire PA system they're just replacing the mixer, oh, the mixer if you can recall just in the last year we had to replace the mixer at the football field and that was done oh. now that works well but uh, this is what 8 uh, 15 23 years old mm -hmm. so it's time to replace yeah all right any other questions for operations committee all right, then we'll go to Staff Welfare Committee, Rufus. Staff Welfare Committee uh, met yesterday, and uh, we discussed the new position of elementary dean of students, which Nicole has already uh, briefed us on. Uh, we had a information that we'll be discussing a couple business points, uh, you know, at a, at a forthcoming meeting, and then the other important uh, topic was uh, information c coming from uh, staff development and curriculum committee regarding QCOMP revisions and just for information QCOMP is a program through the state that is provides incentives to, for districts to you know to enhance their professional development programs within the schools and it includes uh, elements of teachers observing other teachers to critique their, you know, their their tactics in the classroom and offering suggestions on how, you know, how they might, you know, Im improve, uh, you know, their instruction. And uh, so, the staff development and curriculum committee um, is proposing that. A major change in the in the observation piece of this program, and they are proposing that that the district hire two full time observers, or I I like to think of them as coaches, you know, teaching coaches, um, you know, to work with the, the teachers throughout the district to, you know, to you know help uh, improve instruction in the classroom. And I, I think this is an important uh, step forward because at the at last year's uh, school board conference, I met with uh, uh, well, there were a couple of presentations by a couple of school districts around the state that have uh, introduced this this strategy into the district. You know, hiring you know a, a group of uh, full time coaches, and you know, and it's met they met with great success. You know, improving uh, you know student achievement, um, helping you know basically working with teachers as a as a colleague and a resource, uh, you know, to provide ideas of how you know how to improve uh, instruction. I think uh, that this proposal to hire two full-time uh, observers will have to be approved by the teachers' union, mm -hmm. you know, and hopefully they'll they'll endorse it. Right? But uh, I think it's a great step forward. And it was and Nicole, you were there yesterday too. It was almost a unanimous vote. Out of the staff development curriculum committee, I think just one person voted against it, and uh, and this money, by the way, would come from the uh, QCOMP revenue that's generated. So it's not additional; it's not an additional expense for the school district. It's uh, it's money that's uh, generated. We, if you're a QCOMP district, you get two hundred and sixty dollars per student of additional state aid and some of its local property taxes to uh, to pay for that program. So it generates about four hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Each year, and so uh, if we had two full-time faculty members, one at the elementary, one at the high school, and one of the uh, one of the comments that came up yesterday was that uh, one of the teachers pointed out that one advantage of having two people is that they get to see all 115 faculty members, and so uh, they they really get to concentrate on 50 or 60 faculty members, and as they see more people, they can say, "Gee." You should go see what so and so is doing because I just saw this yesterday, and and rather than right now we have over 20 individual teachers that 
serve as part-time teacher observers, and they see maybe four or five teachers throughout the year. And uh, one of the big things that the state requires is that you have what's called inter-rater reliability. In other words, consistency in the observation process. And so uh, I think the Staff Development Committee felt that by having two fully trained people that really, that's all they do is, is coach teachers on um, what they're doing well and suggestions on what they might try differently might be a better way to go. And so it will be an important decision for the faculty to make. And uh, as administrators, of course, we don't have a vote on the Staff Development Committee, but we were there to uh, listen. Uh, it was a, I thought it was a very good discussion, don't you think? Nicole? Yes, it was. And it, it, there was a lot of thought put into it by everyone. It was not a quick discussion. It was quite lengthy, and um, that took up the majority of the meeting. And I, I could tell by the discussion that was had that people have really been reflecting about how to better serve our students and and our teachers it's not easy to be a an observer and a full-time teacher uh, it it takes a lot of time to be an observer and just how we can better meet the needs of our staff and our students so, so what would be the requirements uh, what would be the training necessary for for someone that would be employed in that job well, I think first of all you want you have to be at least a certified teacher and then um, someone that had significant experience, I would think. Uh, it might be someone that has a strong curriculum background. So is there any uh, post-secondary education offered in Minnesota right now that, that um, specializes in that field? They actually, the Minnesota Dep Department of Education provides professional training for uh, uh, QCOMP observers and QCOMP coaches, uh, and which is very well done. I think also there are faculty members uh, on our staff that have a really strong curriculum background or are just outstanding teachers that uh, our hope is that by, by the teachers making that decision within the next month, then, uh, then the next process is going to be uh, to recruit two people that would be willing to either step out of the classroom. One of the things that the staff curriculum committee wanted is that a three-year commitment. So if you're going to come out of the classroom, that we want you to come out for at least three years uh, so that we have continuity over the three-year process. Um, and of course, and if we can't find anybody or if, if no one steps forward in our current faculty, then that gives us time to recruit somebody to come into our system. So whether it's an internal candidate or candidates or external candidates. Uh, but there are people, you know, Dan, that do go back to school specifically for curriculum. And instruction and um, so I think there's a but we also have we have some very good faculty members I think that would maybe be interested in this position so there are conferences as well they mm -hmm. we discussed that last night too uh, whether it's better to have teachers go to these conferences these training conferences and just have one or two go or to have an online conference course that's very um, hands-on where you can have a lot of teachers participate and uh, so for PLC leaders as well there's there's a lot of training that the state offers and that uh, it's not it's not something new to have training of this tr type of training available and my understanding was there were several options presented mm -hmm. to talk about so mm -hmm. it wasn't just right this was right there were yeah how many options did you there were like? three options mm -hmm. that the SDCC looked at the one that was had the majority vote was the option that Rufus um, talked about. And then the two other options, um, the first option, I don't even remember because nobody voted for it and it wasn't even hardly discussed. <laughs> the second option was to have one teacher uh, who had, who was just, it was kind of to keep it as it is, but to have one teacher who has time set aside at the high school. Uh, for one hour a day to do just paperwork for a QCOM because it is very paperwork intensive. You know, to, to Dan's question about uh, about competence, um, you know, one of the things that I've discovered, you know, you know, since I've been on the school board and, and trying to immerse myself in the, the science of education is that you know a lot has been done in the last 20 years in terms of studying. Uh, education and trying to figure out, you know, what strategies work, you know, what strategies are less effective, and and there's and there's and it's a it's a complicated area, 
and there's but there's a lot of information out there and the, the challenge for teachers is to try to incorporate all of this good information into you know into their classroom uh, approach and that that's why it you know it's a great idea to have a a, a couple individuals who you know who can be the resident experts on a, you know on this information and they can be as I say uh, you know a resource for their colleagues mm -hmm. and they can go you know and they can you know keep current with you know with the the, the science and the information by going to conferences you know both <laughs> in person and online but it's you know it, it, it there's a, a great deal of expertise and we do have a few teachers you know on the faculty that you know that have really taken you know this very seriously and are you know our resident experts and 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 but we don't have them in a full-time position right now and so you know I think you know whether it's with from within or from without I think it would be a, a great addition to the district it's, it's good something to think about and you know see what the best options are be so yeah very good all right any other questions for staff welfare well, it is 6 o'clock, exactly. So we'll have Sue come back and um, talk to us about the truth of taxation, and we'll work on that. You should have documents in front of you on, on her presentation. Okay, um, tonight on the agenda we have the approval of the 2015 payable 2016 tax levy and as a requirement of that we have a truth and taxation hearing which is what we're doing tonight but before I get to the PowerPoint I just wanted to remind you of a few things um, the levy is set in calendar year 2015 taxpayers pay during calendar year 2016 the school district will have these dollars available for their use during the 1617 school year which starts July 1 2016 even though this pay 16 levy is for the 1617 school year, I just wanted to remind you of two things that happened actually for the 1415 school year that continue on. Um, one of those is that the state now funds all day everyday kindergarten and that started, like I said, in the 1415 school year, so we're in the second year of that. And also that the um, pupil unit weighting changed. So now all of our students through grade six are weighted at a 1.0 and our secondary students are now weighted at a 1.2. Uh, the formula allowance for a, a student in kindergarten through sixth grade is $6,067 for that 16-17 school year, so for next school year. And so our secondary students, grades seven through 12, the formula is $7,280.40. Uh, school districts have levy authority in two ways. One is by legislative action and the other is by voter approval. Uh, so um, something new, and Superintendent Brown um, discussed this a little bit tonight, but um, previously school districts, when we had building issues um, to address, the school was not allowed to simply increase their levy to levy for those types of things unless there was voter approval. Um, we did have some deferred maintenance dollars, but it really wasn't enough to address the needs that, that we had. So in addition to those uh, deferred maintenance dollars, districts um, would use classroom dollars for things like building repairs, roof repairs, parking lot improvements, or they could go to their voters and ask for approval, or things were not repaired timely. But new for the 16-17 school year, so our next school year, uh, school districts will have levy authority to levy for long-term facility maintenance issues. Uh, so now when we have building issues to address, we'll have a funding mechanism to do so. 
Um, as Superintendent Brown mentioned, we needed to come up with a 10-year plan for our facilities, and we had a pretty short window to get that done. So we are planning to revisit that annually. And as of right now, we're going to do that in January with our operations committee and our supervisor of building and grounds. So what we want to do there is really plan out our deferred maintenance projects like those roofing, painting, lighting replacements, parking lot resurfacing, track resurfacing, bleach replacements. You know, really plan that out over, you know, 10 years and, and come up with a good, well thought out plan. Um, just looking at the levy here, just to remind you that it, it is based on estimates. We put in estimated pupil units for our 16-17 school year, and here we are, we're just in December of the prior year. So it is really estimates. And then we put in estimates for things like um, reemployment. So then what happens is in future levies, when we have actual numbers, there are adjustments to our levies to bring things to actual. Um, our 2015 payable 2016 tax levy is proposed to go up by 5%. Uh, there are three main areas that our levy is changing, our levy authority is changing, that will result in this increase. Um, our operating referendum, the levy share, or the, the split, because um, our, re our referendum is not going up, but the split of how it's paid, some is state aid and some is, is local levy, the split of that is changing. So the local levy piece is going up by about $88,000, and that's because our referendum market value of the district is going up. Okay. And then also our local option revenue, the levy share there is going up by $46,000. And that's also due to our referendum market value of the district going up. And then the third reason is this long-term facilities maintenance um, levy. With this new levy authority, it's $193 per pupil unit for the 16-17 school year. So that's about $361,000. Uh, I'm not quite sure if Superintendent Brown mentioned, mentioned this or not, but this long-term facilities maintenance levy is something that the largest 25 school districts in the state always had authority to do. And, uh, you know, they had that for many, many years, and people really did feel that was unfair to the smaller and moderate-sized school districts because we have facility needs as well. So then the legislature did provide a mechanism for our size school district to do this, and, and so we were very pleased about that. Um, now I will move on to the PowerPoint. Um, as I mentioned, it's the 2015 payable 2016 Truth and Taxation meeting. Um, there is a Truth and Taxation law that tells us what we need to do. Um, one thing is that all taxpayers need to receive a mailed notice of what their proposed taxes are. That notice actually comes from the county. So in September, after the board approves the proposed amount, then I forward on to the county and the state what our proposed amount is, and then the county puts that together and mails that out. And then we must have a public meeting, and that's what we're doing here tonight. As part of this public meeting, we need to do a few things. One is um, we talk about the proposed taxes for payable 2016. We need to talk about our current year budget, the 15-16 budget that was approved by the board on November 24th, and then the public is allowed time to speak. A few points to remember, um, our revenue formulas are set by the state legislature, except for voter approved referendums. The local levy and state aid mix or split are set by the state legislature, and some are dependent on that referendum market value or adjusted net tax capacity of the district. And an increase in local taxes does not necessarily mean an increase in revenues. Like with that referendum, we're going to receive the same amount, it's just where it comes from. Okay, now we'll move to the budget. Um, this is the budget that the board approved on November 24th. So just a little overview on our funds. Um, general fund or fund one, um, our revenue is um, based on projected student enrollment. The learning levy is part of the general fund. The general fund is where we provide for um, our classroom instruction, our supplies, our equipment, our activities. It's also where we pay for our special education costs, as well as our pupil transportation and our extracurricular activities. So that would be all of our fine arts and, and our sports. Then the food services fund too, and this is where we have our revenues and expenditures for our school breakfast and lunch program, our summer feeding program, and our new fresh fruit and vegetable program. 
Then we have the Community Service Fund, which is Fund 4. Uh, the levy here for community education is based on the population of the district. And the early childhood levy is based on the number of children under five years of age. Um, this is where we provide enrichment programs for any age that's not part of the K-12 um, education program. And so we have um, different things in this fund, like our adult basic education, our school readiness, um, early childhood family education, and community education and recreation. And then in Fund 5 is our capital fund. Um, just to remind, the, um, remind you, I'm, I believe the board, you'll probably remember this, we keep our funds one and five separate, our, our capital fund and our general fund, but the state does look at those combined. Um, so in the capital fund is where we'll have this long-term facilities maintenance um, levy. This is that new levy authority we spoke of. Um, this replaces the deferred maintenance and the health and safety levy. And then this is where we have our capital expenditures and improvements. Then we have our debt service levy, which is Fund 7, and this is where we pay for our, um, for our bonds, for our, our building bonds, and we do have four building bonds. And then we have our trust and agency, which are Funds 15 and 17, our enrichment and hunt farm um, fund, and then Fund 10 is student activities. So now looking at the actual um, revenue budget, um, again, this is what the board approved on November 24th. So in total, our revenue budget is $23,103,785. Uh, in the general fund, that's $17,853,000. So where, where does our money come from? 83.3% comes, comes to us in the form of state aid. 2.5% come to us in the form of federal aid, 11.3% is local taxes, and 29 is other local dollars. Um, just to remind you, in case I didn't say this, this is the general fund. So the, the slide before was all funds, but for the general fund, um, this is where the dollars come from. Now looking at our expenditures, in total $23,441,725. And in the general fund, 18246000 You You prob probably noticed that a couple slides ago, the revenue for the general fund was only $17,853,000, where expenditures are $18,246,000. Um, that's because we are spending some dollars out of some assigned fund balances. Um, so those are dollars that were saved in prior years that we assigned for certain, certain things. And those are like in technology, curriculum, staff development, QCOMP, and literacy. So then we go to how are our general fund dollars spent? Well, we spend 4.2% of our dollars on district and school administration. And that is about $234 per student less than the state average. And that state average figure comes from when our auditors were here and they presented the audit report. They actually gather data um, on all school districts, what they're spending on certain things. And so this, that information comes right from our auditors. Regular instruction, we spend um, just about 50% of our general fund dollars. Vocational instruction, just about 3%. And that's about $104 more per student than the state average. So in vocational, we spend more. And then instructional support services is 6.3%. But that, just to let you know, that's curriculum, um, media center, staff development, those types of things. Pupil support, we're just under 10%. And that's where we have our counseling, our nursing department, our transportation, pupil transportation. So just another way to look at it, what does our general fund budget pay for? Well, we, um, our salary and wages come up to 50.4% of our general fund budget. Then if you add our benefits of 16.8%, that comes up with salary and benefits are 67.2% of our budget. Well, in addition to that, we contract with Southern Plains for some of our special education services. So if I would add to that the amount that we would pay Southern Plains, that would come up to 79% of our budget is for salaries and benefits. Um, our payment to Southern Plains is in the area of purchase services. A couple other things that are in that area are transportation, electricity, and water. 
and then supplies and materials are 5.3 percent and in addition to supplies and materials as it says we, that's where our um, curriculum would be and our heating for our buildings and then capital and other are just are under one percent so then looking at the components of the general fund fund balance or where do we expect to end the year and this was part of the um, budget that the board approved the last time so we're looking at um, at the end of the year on June 30th 2016 we're, we're estimating we'll have about hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars in the staff development area about hundred and eight thousand in the committed for masonry four hundred thousand dollars in committed for OPEB which is other post employment benefits about 1.3 million in assigned fund balances in the areas of you know literacy technology curriculum wellness and QCOMP and about 3 million in our unassigned area as you remember our goal is two months and so this is right at that two months so we're very pleased about that um, we do know that there's been a few things that have been approved since the board approved the budget last month like the um, Dean of students at the elementary that will start in January and some of the music things and and so we, we know that our our budget is will be changing and so I'll bring a new budget back to the board here this spring okay uh, moving back to the levy um, this is kind of a repeat it's the 2015 payable 2016 levy for the 1617 school year we set it here in calendar year 2015 taxpayers pay in calendar year 2016 um, authority for school levies comes to a school district either um, by states st set by the legislature or state um, formula or voter approved and then we look at how are our um, how are our levy dollars spent well we spend 50 percent of them in the general fund or general and then our capital fund and that's for district instructional programs and then three percent go in community education and 47 percent in debt service and again debt service is where we have our four bond issues for our buildings looking at how does this compare with our last levy so um, our pay 15 actual levy was five million one hundred forty one thousand our proposed pay 16 or this levy um, five million three hundred ninety nine thousand which is a two hundred and fifty seven thousand dollar increase or a five percent increase um, just a couple points to um, mention uh, how could your property um, taxes increase or decrease well the value of your property could increase or decrease or the value of other properties may increase or decrease and that would change the share that your property is of the tax base whether your value changed or not or there could be voter approval um, so here's just a recap of by fund the payable 2016 what we have proposed and then I added this um, slide after the operations meeting on Thursday we just wanted to kind of do a little comparison in pay 13 um, we levied five million four hundred sixty eight thousand pay 14 was five million five hundred and seventy seven thousand pay 15 five million one hundred and forty one thousand so that last year when we had this hearing we had that reduction of four hundred thirty six thousand and now for pay 16 we're at five million three hundred ninety nine thousand nineteen dollars and sixty five cents and that is um, even though that is that five percent increase it is still less than we had in pay 13 and pay 14 and as you remember the three the three reasons on why ours is going up um, the two of them were for the split with um, the referendum market value going up and the the other one is the long-term facilities maintenance you know without the long-term facilities maintenance you know we would not have an increase in our levy it would actually be going down a little bit so I have a clarifying question the um, the tax statements that our property owners have received they've already received them right correct and previously we had a higher percent than five percent did, did we no our max amount was higher but we the board took action in September for the five percent for the proposed and that's what went to the county was okay, the proposed so the, amount so, so the tax statements that people have received is accurate well based on our five percent proposed amount okay. correct good you know I, I, if a district was going out for a referendum that would not have been on someone's tax statement but we did not have that here so for example the three districts in the county Martin County West 
which increased their operating levy, Truman that increased their operating levy, and Grenada and Huntley East Chain, which increased their operating levy, the actual taxes that people will pay in those three districts will be probably be higher than what was on their tax statement. I believe that to be correct. Because the tax statement came out before the voters approved. Right, right. Okay. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, final question on that. When did taxpayers know exactly what to pay then? When they have their statement in the spring. Well, they'll get a, they'll yep. get a new statement. Right. That will be the revised statement. Right. Okay. Right. The actual what you actually pay on. Because did, who was it? Was it Grenada Huntley East Chain was one that passed the new bond for a gymnasium, right? Right. And they also passed right. an increase in their operating levy. Right. And like with their bond, I don't know if it, that will go on their um, pay 16 taxes. I guess I didn't follow that. And Truman increased their operating levy. And Martin County West increased their operating levy, but they also did some facility stuff. Mm -hmm. So that will hit those taxes, too. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from the board? And I just want to say publicly, we have two board members that need to, they have, they have family issues they need to deal with at 630. So <laughs> you need to be, if you need to be excused, go ahead and get going. Yep. But Do you have any questions? The rest of us will stay. Do you two have any questions? Do you three have any questions? Come up. Yeah. Mark Catava. The uh, you said you did not have a ten-year plan for facilities maintenance, but yet you are levying tax dollars at a five percent increase. So how do you know no. how much to? ask for I'll answer that we had to come up so with the mic Mike. Okay. Okay. Um, what we had to come up with a 10-year plan which we did and our supervisor of building and grounds has always done an amazing job and usually has a three to five year plan anyway but in order to levy for this we had to submit to the Department of um, Education a 10-year plan and all districts had to do that. and all districts had to do that in order to be able to levy right so it was just finalizing that and getting it to them no, we had to come up with a tenure plan in a short time frame. Yeah. Sorry if I misspoke. We, we, uh, our district always had at least a three-year plan or a five-year plan. That was not required by state statute, but we always had one to, so we could project down the road. But under state statute, they do require all districts to have a tenure plan. And it was pretty easy for us to put that together because we already had a five-year plan in place. And that 10-year plan, by the way, is available. If you need a copy of that, we'd be glad to provide that to you. And we're going to review it again in um, yeah. January. That we want to do every year to review it. Yep. The benefit of that is, you know, as you remember a couple of years ago, we had to go with the facilities improvement, um, you know, in which we had to go to the taxpayers and then, you know, for bond referendums to, you know, to pay for that. And now, because it's part, and we can we can budget those things throughout as the years come up. We can avoid that. We can keep our buildings and that in good shape, um, and then you know, take good care of our things, but be able to budget for it as well as, mm -hmm. as each thing comes up. Right, and look at like let's say your parking lots, and and you know, however many years those should be, you know, seal coated or you know whatever right. the right word Just is. Just like anybody you know, would right. do in a business. Yep. So I think we have a good plan. It was put together fairly quick, but we do have a good plan that we'll continue to look at annually. It's not set in stone. It's just... It's a plan. It's a plan. It's a plan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. It's a plan. Yeah. You know, because something, you know, um, we're looking at doing roofing starting in, in July. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe some other need could pop up that we feel is more important that we thought we were going to do in three years. Any other questions? Do we know how much the other districts are going up? I could have found that out, but I didn't. Okay, I guess we'll find out. We'll have to read the paper or listen to the radio. But, okay. Are there any other questions? Very clear, very good. Thank you. I'll give one last call for questions. All right, then the board will need to take action on this. Would you? Let me get back to that page in my agenda. 
So yes, I would then um, make a motion to approve the 2015-2016 payable tax levy as presented in the amount of, which amount should I use, the $5,399,019.65? Correct. Okay. Right, right, Sue? Correct. All right. Thank you. All right, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rufus. I have a motion by Julie, second by Rufus to approve the um, 2015 payable 2016 tax levy as presented um, for $5,399,019.65 or 5%. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Okay, anything, any other business that the board needs to talk about this evening? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. Thank you, Julie. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rufus. I have a motion by Julie, second by Rufus, to approve adjourning the school board meeting at 6.24 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for coming.